Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome you to this afternoon session P14. Which it's named Intergenerational Dementia Initiatives. So it's a female session. And we all talk, or you all, all talk about um, intergenerational project from five different countries. And I, uh, my name is Sabine Jansen. I'm the executive director of the German Alzheimer Association. And I'm very pleased to introduce now our five speakers. And the first one is um, from the Netherlands, is Fania Dassen from the Maastricht University, from the Alzheimer Centrum Limburg. And she's speaking about the adoption project. So Fania, um, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. Uh, hi, welcome everyone. My name is uh, indeed Fania Dassen. And I'm going to present to you today about our adoption project, or in Dutch, it's the Adoptie project, Jong Adopteert Oud. Uh, the goals of this project were to reduce uh, stigmatization and taboo and open up the conversation about dementia. We wanted to also educate children about dementia so they learn about the world of people with dementia. And we wanted to enhance social participation of people with dementia living in a care home. This is uh, the project of the project team involved with the adoption project at Maastricht University at the Alzheimer Center Limburg. I work uh, on this project together with Professor Marjolein de Vught and Professor Frans Verheij, who were already involved when the proje project started in the year 2004. And now I also work together with my colleague, Dr. Niels Janssen. In 2018, we started a collaboration with uh, Alzheimer Nederland, so Alzheimer Netherlands Association. So they're also now implementing, implementing our project together with their ambassadors and volunteers. And the person responsible for this is Ms. Klaasje Voskel peters Today, I want to um, talk uh, a little bit more about the project and what it entails in practice and also some lessons learned and future directions with the project. The project um, in basics it entails a connection between a primary school and a close by care institution. They make mutual agreements to see how they're going to yeah, give this um, project uh, its form. They make uh, together, they uh, see what, when can the children visit, how often will they visit. Then we provide them with an interactive lesson on dementia to prepare the children a little on the visit and tell them a little bit more about dementia. Then the visits of the children, they start. And then at the end of the school year, we come together again. We have an evaluation. We make agreements for the next year. So this is meant as a structural project. So a long-term collaboration between primary school and care institution. So a little bit more details. The first step is to find a primary school who's interested to join the project and to make this connection with a care home or a daycare or a green farm. A lot of things are possible. And it's especially difficult to find schools to make them enthusiastic for the project because they're already so busy with all these other projects that come by. So it really helps if you have a personal connection or some way to go to be able to get an appointment and to talk about the project. And then they're often, yeah, very enthusiastic and you can think along. Well, as soon as this connection has been formed between school and care home, you go sit together around the table and you're going to make agreements to make a tailored approach. So what is possible for the children? We mainly target a project on children aged eight to 12. So this is in the Netherlands class seven and eight. They're a little bit older, a bit more independent. So, but you can also of course involve younger children in the project. And you're going to discuss with probably the teacher of the school and the people from the care home, what can we do? Is it possible that small groups of children come visit every week for a few hours to do really one-on-one -on -one activities with the residents, or if it's, this is more difficult to organize, maybe the whole class can come by, have a little tour and do an activity together. So this is really seeing 
what is possible for this specific connection. Then uh, we come to school and we give this really interactive lesson for the children. So it's not meant to give them a whole lot of information. We really want to make them enthusiastic about the topic. So we start with a little memory test and we ask them, what do you already know about the brain? Did you hear before about dementia or do you know someone? Is it normal to forget things? When is it not normal anymore? And we also give them some tips how to yeah, deal with people with dementia. Like don't talk very enthusiastic and very quick because they won't be able to grasp what you're saying. And that closed questions are easier than open questions. For instance, do you want coffee or tea? It's much more easy than what do you want to do? And things like that. So after the lesson, the visits of the children start and a lot of activities are possible. They can help with lunch, for instance. They can go for a walk together, play games, bake something, read a book. All kinds of activities are possible. And it's just daily activities which don't have to cost a lot. Then, as I already said, at the end of the year, you get together again with the teacher from the primary school, someone from the healthcare institution and yourself. And we see how did it go? What did work? What didn't go well? Do we need to yeah, do it uh, less often? Should the visits be on a different day? Maybe um, more children or less children should come. So you do these little adaptations. And then you schedule the project again for the next school year. So you have a new group seven and group eight who are going to participate. They again get the lesson on dementia and then they will visit the elderly with dementia in the care home. So this is in a nutshell, the project and its steps. Of course, due to COVID-19, it was really difficult to continue with the project. At first, yeah, when the nursing homes and the primary school closed, it all came to a stop for a moment. But then we try to keep really keep the connection alive between the schools and the elderly. So we did things like visits at the window, the children went by and sang songs, they waved to the people, they did send Christmas cards, they also made a video accompanying this so they could still tell them, hey, we are the children from this school. And if possible, the people with dementia would also write some cards back. So we kind of came up with some things to still do on a distance. But of course, it's not ideal. We really hope that this in-person visits will be possible again very soon. In the meantime, we also did a process evaluation and we did this via online questionnaires to see how the project was going, what works well and what can we, yeah, can we change? And we really saw that what really makes this project happen, a facilitator is the involvement and enthusiasm of this triangle. So this ambassador of the project, the person from primary school and the person from the healthcare organization, if they are enthusiastic and they are involved and want to invest time, yeah, a lot is possible. It was also really valued that the project is always tailored to the individual school and healthcare institution. So you really sit together and see what can we do at this place? And it also really helps if it fits within the curriculum. So if you can link it to a topic which is already part of their curriculum or find another nice way to fit it in. And also this personal entry at the school. If you know already a teacher, if you have your own child there at school, that really helps to get at least this first contact. Because otherwise, if just like me emails a school and they don't know me, they're just like, oh, we're too busy. And that was also one of the biggest barriers of the project. Schools are so busy these days. So you really need to think along with them. How can we fit this into the curriculum? Because of course, we think and we hope they also value that this is really important to do. And the main barrier that was mentioned was, of course, COVID-19, which makes it really difficult to have children physically visit the elderly. We got some nice uh, quotes from the children. So we got these questions like, are you going to believe in Santa Claus again if you have dementia? Can my pet get Alzheimer's? Some really uh, nice enthusiastic replies like I really got a bonus grandma or like really cool chilling with the elderly. 
And also someone said, I feel so sorry for my mother that grandma has Alzheimer's. We also got some nice uh, comments from uh, the staff care home. They saw the added value of the project and they really said like doing these things together, it gives the people a feeling of presence. So it stimulates them to make contact, to have fun again. And also there's like a positive vibe that the children bring in and that stays within the, yeah, the home. So that really helped. And also teachers were very positive. Like we went there, visited the care institution almost every week. The children really liked it and we definitely support the project and will continue again next year. So this was really nice to hear. We're also now planning an explorative effect study. So really a scientific study because we have all these nice enthusiastic replies, but we never yeah, studied this scientifically. So we have a plan. We already have ethical approval and our research assistant is trained. We translated the questionnaire, but we're still waiting, of course, for the visits to happen again to start with the study. We have two aims. We want to see whether during this visit of the pupils, the well-being of the person with dementia increases. And we will do this with observations. So the research assistant will be there and make notes about what's happening. And we do semi-structured interviews with the care home staff. For the children, we will examine whether the knowledge about dementia increases and whether the attitude towards people with dementia, whether that improves. We do this by a questionnaire, the kids, the kids insight into dementia survey, which was developed in Australia. And we already translated it to Dutch. We also did a little pilot in a class to see how it works. So uh, we're almost ready to go. We're just waiting for these visits to be possible again. So all these things um, should help and contribute to the dementia friendly society, which we all want to reach in the end. So we want to educate children, but also with this project, we reach, of course, their parents, the teachers at school, their family. So we hope to reach a lot of people by doing this. And that would be my talk about uh, the adoption project. So I want to thank you for your attention. Here are some of the funding we received from Son and Way. It's part of the Eén tegen Eenzaamheid, the United Against Loneliness campaign they're currently doing. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I hope uh, I gave a little overview of the project. Feel free to email me if you want more details, of course. And then I would like to give back the word to our host. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, um, Fania, for this interested um, project. And um, I can imagine that that was really difficult in COVID-19 times to, to come to the schools because I have many, many other problems. There's one um, question um, in the chat and also a thank you. Um, and the question is, did you consider interviewing people with dementia as well for your upcoming evaluation study? Yes, yeah. At first, we planned to um, do these uh, focus groups with also with children in the classrooms and with the people with dementia participating. But this wasn't possible because of, again, COVID. So for now, we started with these online questionnaires to get uh, some feedback already. And we still hope to do these evaluations also with the children in the class and with the people with dementia or their family members. And we also have one via Alzheimer Netherlands. We have a person with dementia herself who is part of their uh, kind of how do you call it advisory board. And she is also closely involved. So we have meetings half a year and then she also joins us and gives her feedback about the project because we really want to involve of course the people with dementia what it is about to see what they think so yes that's still our plan but unfortunately we couldn't execute it yet and the two other questions uh, thank you so far um, fania there's a question do you have to deal with liability like spilled hot coffee and um, one question one more question if it's possible to share the structure of the sessions with the students. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't fully get the first question. Um, it's, do you have to deal with liability like spilled hot coffee? 
Ah, um, you mean like during the visits that maybe things happen or? Yes, probably. I. Yes, I yeah, it's I always know. important that there's someone who guides the children because, yeah, people with dementia can, of course, have a mood swing and maybe get a little very happy, but also very sad or a bit annoyed because it's, of course, very busy if the children visit. So there's always a dedicated person from the care home who is present and the children can go to when something happens. And also the teacher always makes sure to talk with them afterwards, like how did the visit go? How did you experience it? So yeah, we try to cover if unpredictable things happen. Thank you once more, Franja, also for answering the questions. Um, and good luck to go on with your project. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. And for the structure. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, the second question. Short. Was, yeah, very short. Um, yeah, the structure of the visit, it's always a tailored approach. So sometimes it's an hour and the children serve coffee and tea and then they do a game together or the children come up with what they want to do themselves and bring a book to read or something or they do they bake something so that always depends on the connection and what they decided but i can share some inspiration via email of course about how we give this visits uh, their form so yeah good question thanks thank you <laughs> now i will stop talking thank you uh, once more um and I would like to introduce the next speaker. So it's Chiara O'Reilly from Ireland. I hope I pronounced the name in a proper way. And she will tell us about the body program of the Alzheimer's Society. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kira um, O'Reilly and I am delighted to welcome you to this presentation about my ongoing work developing an intergenerational um, dementia intervention, a, a body program. So I've been working with the Alzheimer's Society for a number of years now, and through various outreach campaigns, have come to recognize some issues which come up kind of regularly. Uh, the core problems they see have been a lack of awareness or understanding about dementia and Alzheimer's disease in younger people, um, common misconceptions about it, stigma as it relates to dementia. Um, and despite a variety of services available for people affected by dementia, there's still a clear lack. We're not meeting everyone's needs. So through Dublin City University and um, with support of from the Alzheimer's Society, I have been good at conducting research into the areas of dementia, stigma and services with a view to addressing these. So this is just a quick guide to show you the steps of today's presentation. We'll look briefly at a snapshot, the current snapshot of dementia in Ireland, um, the supports and services available, the aim of this work um, and how the co-development process feeds into it. And then because this is an ongoing project, um, I'll quickly highlight the next steps. The current dementia landscape is a stark one. There are 64,000 people living with dementia in Ireland. Uh, 11,000 new cases of dementia are diagnosed each year, which amounts to 30 people every single day. So these figures have increased annually with international statistics showing the same upward trend. And current predictions from our National Dementia Office suggest that by 2045, there'll be over 150,000 people living with the disease. It's the responsibility of society then to provide the necessary scaffolding and supports to ensure that individuals who are affected by Alzheimer's disease can continue to live well. So as 63% of people living with dementia live in the community and wish to continue to do so, support programs which foster communication and social inclusion can have a really positive impact on the life of the person living with dementia. There are a variety of supports available throughout Ireland, um, as well as to people living with dementia, but as also to their families and carers. So day centres, home care supports, social clubs and support groups. Um, a lot of these were obviously suspended at the onset of the pandemic, but are currently in a phased reopening. Accessing community-based dementia supports, such as a day centre, allows the person living with dementia to continue to socialise and maintain their skills of daily living. The shared environment encourages individuals to engage in group activities like music, dancing or, or art or even days out. Um, and in addition to providing cognitive stimulation, Research has shown that attending a day centre is a way of including people with dementia in social and community life. But the local day centre is not suitable for everyone for a variety of reasons. There could be a language barrier or there might not be one nearby. There might be one 10 kilometres away, but you don't drive and can't get to it. Um, or the activities offered just don't suit your preference or you're the kind of person who never really enjoyed a group environment. Some people just do better in a smaller setting. 
during one of the focus groups, one attendee commented that the day center had never been the appropriate environment for her mom. Her mom had been diagnosed with early onset dementia at 62 years of age. And her mom felt the day center was really only for old people. Um, and she felt like the odd one out because, and she was already anxious because of her dementia. So encouraging a person living with dementia who has never enjoyed larger social settings to forgo their preferences in favor of attending the local, the only local dementia support actually undermines that person's right to choose. Their preferences for quieter, smaller social settings should not preclude them from socially engaged supports. Rather, support to suit their needs must be advised. Therefore, a greater variety of person-centered alternative supports in which the person with dementia can still reap the cognitive and social benefits of engagement need to be created. The aim of the work to date has been to develop, to co-develop an intergenerational buddy program that would enable people living with dementia to partner up with a 16 or 17 year old student buddy. Uh, so in Ireland, we have a class, a year in school called transition year, and that's where the 16 and 17 year olds engage in these sort of social projects. So intergenerational relationships and programs are known to have a positive impact, not just on older people, but also on the younger participants. And by engaging in a social and stimulating activity of mutual interest, we strive to achieve the same positive impact of reduced stigma relating to dementia. Um, it encourages age-friendly communities. If we find improved um, self-esteem and respect through the sharing of knowledge and experience and improved attitudes to older adults for the young volunteers. For the older person, for the person with dementia, the benefits have been known to include enhanced well-being, <coughs> excuse me, communication and self-inclusion through social inclusion through engagement in meaningful activities. So by sharing this project with the students, we're reaching out to a young cohort who may already have had some experience of caring for a loved one with dementia. We can foster a peer supportive environment and teach them that despite the inherent challenges of a diagnosis of dementia, people can and do continue to live well. A buddy program of this kind offers a tangible alternative to the traditional day center. It's an opportunity for the person living with dementia to still be cognitively and socially stimulated by engaging with their student buddy. But the structure of this intervention had to be hammered out. So a number of consultations were held to co-develop the initiative with students, family caregivers and people living with dementia. Given a broad strokes overview of what I had hoped the project could achieve, these contributors were able to identify the benefits of a project of this nature. Social connectedness, accessibility, battling ageism, um, being able to learn from each other. They were also able to brainstorm ways in which the project could be further developed and rolled out beyond its initial geographic scope. So members of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland's Dementia Research Advisory Team offered advice and ideas on the buddy program. They were incredibly supportive and were able to draw on their own experience to let me know what they thought would work best and that which should be left out. So one of the ladies highlighted the benefit of conducting the buddy program online as it made it more accessible. She was saying that in the future she'd like to see it offered to people living with dementia in nursing homes. And other contributors had already had experience of taking part in a different intergenerational project and his positive experience of that project fueled his enthusiasm for this one. We had really good chats about why a traditional day centre environment doesn't suit everyone and why in their experience they felt that people in their lives who had dementia would have preferred an offering such as the buddy program. The focus group attendees were able to guide me on the overall structure of the program. They suggested the activities that should be agreed upon and um, that they should be agreed in advance but also to allow for free form spontaneity. They recommended running the buddy program at weekends, suggesting the students, um, it's something the students went on to suggest as well. So input from the student cohort was equally important to the development process. What would they like to see included? Were there any risks or problems that they could predict? They had already had experience of Zoom-based learning. Did they feel this would still be an engaging way of sharing the project with their classmates? Were there any sorts of benefits to a buddy program like this? And their responses were fantastically supportive. Straight away, they were on board and excited about the prospect of a project like this. Similar to the previous focus group, they were able to see benefits, not just to the people living with dementia, but for their peers as well. And they were able to recognize that it would be stimulating for people with dementia, which I thought was a great word because it really showed that they were latching onto the idea. They discussed using a small questionnaire so that people could be paired up by interest. They suggested running the buddy program at the weekend as well, so that if people had too much on during the week, they could still take part. And they suggested maybe instead of having just a one-to-one -one scenario that people could take part in pairs, which had actually been suggested in the previous focus group of people living with dementia and carers. So there's a lot of similarities. These are the quotes you'll have seen on the previous slides. And I just wanted to highlight them a bit more because I think these little snapshots show the appetite for a project like the Buddy Program. I had mentioned earlier that one focus group attendee had said that her mom never would have taken to the day center environment because it was only for old people as she saw it. She was only in her 60s. You'll see here that another focus group attendee said, 
mom didn't like the day center because she thought she was too young. Now, she was in her 80s, but she didn't see herself as old. And that's fair enough. I love that both focus groups showed a generosity of spirit and that con contributors were able to identify ways in which the buddy program would benefit not just their own cohort, but their counterparts also. They offered suggestions on making the project accessible to even the shyest of students. So the format of the buddy program is built to the specifications teased out in these focus groups. The buddies will meet weekly for one hour on Zoom. It was felt that one hour sessions would be the most appropriate. And I'm sure after 20 months of Zooming, the outside rear conference attendees would appreciate the need to get up and move around. The focus groups with both the students and the people of most dementia and caregivers threw up suggestions for activities that the buddies could engage in during the session. For instance, if both parties were interested in art, we could arrange for them to have materials so as to work on a shared project. Or if they're interested in music or pictures, they can talk through uh, building a shared Spotify playlist or building um, an online photo album. There had to be scope within the partnership for both participants to have input into how they'd like to spend their time, but also an acceptance that it's okay to just chat rather than to do an activity on that day. Spontaneity is a part of life and that must therefore be a part of the budget program. So the next step for this project is to deliver a dementia awareness presentation to a number of schools covering the topics you see here on the screen. Each of these elements are important as standalones Everyone should know that dementia is not a normal part of aging and doesn't just affect old people. They should know what services are available, why they work and why sometimes they don't or aren't suitable. Um, and all of these elements should collectively work together to erode any lingering stigma and encourage peer support. This dementia presentation then feeds into an overview of the buddy program, similar to that which we've just discussed here. Um, the students are afforded time then to think on the project and the presentation, and then anyone wishing to volunteer for the buddy program is linked back in with the researcher. Um, and in the meantime, researcher will be recruiting people living with dementia for the project also. So that kind of brings us to the end of our little tour of the intergenerational dementia intervention that is the Buddy Programme. I hope I've managed to cover the most salient points today, but I'm certainly available for questions as well. Um, and finally, I just wanted to extend my thanks to you guys for your time today and for the organizers of the Alzheimer Europe Conference for affording me the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chiara, for this presentation. I think how, how normal it is to design such a study with a Zoom format um, is normal. I think that's very different to former times. That's, being that's, totally honest, the first iteration of this project was not Zoom-based. <laughs> ah, okay. <was> my hand. <laughs> I had to get creative in the face of adversity. Okay, thank you. There's also one uh, question in the chat for you. Was there any challenges you came across in designing your work that you didn't think of initially that may be Zoom or not there Zoom? <laughs> the but maybe some other challenges? Um, initially, the, the project, the original version of the project was to have the buddies pair up and meet in their local day center and avail of the facilities there. And that way, if they wanted to bake together or do a gardening project, all of that would be available on site. Um, but then the pandemic landed and the day center shut and didn't reopen <laughs> and the schools were closed um, and everybody had to learn to use Zoom. So after much um, teasing it out and talking it through with the students and the uh, contributors who are living with dementia and the caregivers, um, everyone was on board with Zoom as a feasible alternative that you could certainly do projects online, shared projects online. And, over the past few months, um, certainly you can see how adaptive people have become, you know, everyone has been able to take to the Zoom platform or, you know, WebEx, any of those online um, sites. So it's been great that it was possible to, although it was completely unpredictable, um, it, was, it was great that we had the opportunity to kind of reinvent the project and make it, you know, pandemic proof. So even as things change and as numbers go up and numbers go down, the project can still carry on without, you know, having to shelve it at any stage, hopefully. And if you speak about ongoing, you also think about ongoing with the Zoom format or other formats are um, maybe... For now, thinkable. ongoing with the Zoom format, but down the line, absolutely, I think it would be better. I think it would be great if we could do it in person again. I do think that making use of the uh, facilities at a local day center um, kind of broaden it a bit. And, you know, it opens up the opportunities to engage in alternative activities like the gardening, like the, the shared baking experience. Um, but yeah, I just think there's scope for development, development beyond it, its current iteration. Thank you very much and Thank you. much success with your project. Thanks, Vivian.
Um, I go on in our program and um, the third speaker is from Turkey and I'm really pleased to introduce to you Füsun Kocaman. She is the executive director of the Turkish Alzheimer Association and Füsun, I can say that we are very connected to each other because of a training program uh, between Germany and uh, Turkey some years ago and I'm very pleased to meet you in the session and your floor is yours, the floor is yours now and you are speaking about children are learning dementia. Uh, as Sabine kindly introduced, I am Füsun Kocaman, uh, the Executive Director of Turkish Alzheimer Association. My main task is such international relations and project development and project management and doing the project itself in many of the cases. Uh, before I forget, I would like to thank the uh, Alzheimer Europe for this opportunity to share such experiences within our organizations and from other partners who are doing uh, marvelous work. We are learning from each other. And thank you very much, Sabine, for introducing me. And uh, now about the, uh, the children learning dementia. Before this, I would like to uh, talk about uh, two more projects that we have been um, uh, working on in this intergenerational uh, dementia initiative domain. Uh, we have three projects in this domain. Uh, the first one was Digital Grandchild, is uh, similar to Chiara's Buddy project. Uh, the, uh, when the lockdown started, for especially for people uh, above the age of 65, families reported that their loved ones were very much bored and they didn't know how to keep them busy. And <clears throat> the people were very much agitated at home. So upon this, uh, we started the project Digital Grandchild, uh, assigning one person with dementia to one teenager as a grandparent. And regularly that uh, grandchild uh, called the grandparent, the digital grandparent over the phone, preferably with video like FaceTime, WhatsApp video call or Skype or Zoom. And they were both chatting on, on those calls or singing sometimes. Sometimes the volunteer teenager was playing guitar or piano, sometimes cooking uh, cookies for the grandparent and they were painting together. So it was a very nice occupational or a, a psychological therapy for the um, digital grandparent. And this project, although I'm saying it was, uh, it's still continuing. It started like this. Now it's uh, kind of getting uh, larger and larger. It's getting, we're getting uh, digital grandchildren over cities. We even have a grandchild from United States who speaks Turkish, is connected with a grandparent in Turkey in one of the cities in, in the Aegean part. The second project, again, in the Intergenerational Dementia Initiative is uh, called Tell Me a Story. The volunteering uh, teenager just records a story while reading a story. He or she records the story slowly and clearly and preferably with some animation, some acting, some impersonation. And the recorded video is sent to our association and after a board of uh, advisors on this project, approves the project as far as the language is concerned or the speed of speech is concerned, lots of things, uh, so that it would not do any harm to the person with dementia. The video is played on uh, our, the association's YouTube channel and all the, there is a library, more about a hundred videos are already there and the patients and their families can watch these uh, videos. Now the third one, in, again in this domain, is as uh, I'm going to explain in more detail today, is children are learning dementia. As Fania mentioned in her project, we had some kindergarten children visiting our patients in daycare center and we had been observing those visits and seen that 
the patients were very happy with such young children to be together. And uh, we saw that one of the reasons for this is that those young children are not judgmental. They do not uh, make them feel embarrassed for the questions they cannot answer. And they just continue playing with them, uh, singing with them. So they were very happy. And then we uh, did some research on this uh, subject and we have uh, found out that children are the most open-minded and the receptive uh, portion of the population, but they are the ones who are least informed about dementia because people in many cases do not think that they need to learn or they, their parents are very much busy taking care of the patients uh, during their daily lives and they don't have time to stop and uh, train their children about this disease. Uh, but in fact, these children are very workable, if you mind my saying. Their uh, attitudes, their feelings can be changed and shaped if you approach them uh, properly. So we decided to make a uh, well-structured uh, training, meaning well-structured, I don't mean academic, but pedagogically well-structured so that it will really address the children and their feelings and their fears and their confusions. And we prepared a training and a quiz at the end of this training we're uh, doing with the children. And uh, once we started this, we started the project on the 23rd of April. 23rd of April is a national holiday in Turkey. It's celebrated every year as Children's Day. Since uh, the Republic was uh, established, uh, 23rd of April is Children's Day and lots of foreign children also come to Turkey to celebrate this day. We started the project uh, kind of very, in a very amateur mood with the uh, children that we already have contact with. And we uh, asked them and their parents and their teachers if the training really worked, if they enjoyed it or if they were depressed about it or if they feared more or how they took it. As you can see on these pictures, they were so happy to learn and they were so happy that now they are dementia friends. Now they are capable of doing something. They're able to approach those people and help them. They can uh, uh, give some care to their grandparents. And this is the training. I will show you a very brief video. As you can see, it describes uh, how dementia uh, occurs, what the uh, forgetfulness is about, how it happens. As you can see in this video, we did not omit some technical medical words to make it sound more serious and they feel more confident that now they know that it is a neurodegenerative disease. Now, they cannot pronounce it well, but the, this adds to the uh, seriousness and the importance of this training and they feel more important because uh, they are given this training and the main scope of this um, training is about communication because all these children have people in their families grandparents or grand grand aunts who have this disease and they don't know how to communicate with these patients so we taught them how to communicate with these people, what to do, what not to do, not to fear them, but not to rush them, not to push them. If they repeat something, let them repeat something and not to fear them and not to uh, keep at a distance from them. They are no harm to themselves or to you, but they are just kind of slow and kind of confused. You can even help them so they feel uh, better about themselves and uh, we uh, at the end of this um, this training we uh, ask them 10 questions some of them uh, wrong true or false some of them multiple choice 
questions. And as you can see, we had lots and lots of students uh, joining this program. Uh, some of them were kind of bored in the beginning, but as we continued with some animations and some videos and some more information, they realized that they can understand and this is very much helpful. And in this group, you can see some of their teachers also following the training and we contact those, contacted those teachers after the training and they said that the uh, the the um, uh, the reactions of the children, the empathy they have developed uh, it was very much positive and they, uh, they, they had a much positive and accepting perception of people with uh, disabilities in general and uh, they benefited a lot from this um, training. And in designing the training, uh, this is the quiz that I will just uh, give you a small demo. But in designing the training, we considered the probable reactions from the children and the teenagers, such as anxiety or even fear. What, they, what will happen to the person they love now they have a disease? They, they, they can be sad or they can worry that the person will just... Uh, drop dead immediately or the disease is contagious or their parents can also uh, can get the disease or they can even feel embarrassed because their grandfather is like this or they can be bored of all these questions being asked and asked again and again the same stories being told again and again they can feel anger because their parents are busy with those people, not them anymore, or they can feel guilt because they feel all these feelings. So we always tell them that their feelings are normal and the disease is not contagious. All that is happening is because of the disease, not the person, and there is no one to blame. And we use some simple wording, we are very careful about using humor because humor can sometimes sound as mocking or teasing or taking it lightly. And we give them the opportunity to express themselves. As you can see, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, there is a video here. This is the a very brief part of the quiz that we apply and in this, they all uh, write true or false on a piece of paper, show it on, the Zoom, on their Zoom screens. And whether there is a wrong answer or not, we always say why the wrong answer is wrong and why, what the true uh, correct answer is. So it's kind of repeating the same training and uh, 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 emphasizing what they have learned and uh, making their uh, training stronger. This is um, one of the screens where they are answering on a piece of the D is for true, Doro is for true. So some of them are saying why, false, and we are taking this uh, opportunity to re-explain the same uh, object again, so subject again, sorry. And as I said, uh, all the teachers and parents, uh, we haven't done an, a scientific uh, questionnaire type of survey yet, but the, the feedback, the verbal observations and feedback is very positive. And uh, I will complete my uh, presentation with one uh, child's comment about at the very end of the training and quiz, she expresses uh, what, what she has learned from this training, how we should uh, communicate with persons with dementia. This is, uh, she of course speaks in Turkish, but I tried to insert some subtitles. We must be loving to them. To the person with that. And she repeats it not only to patients, but to everyone. We should be patient and loving. We should treat everyone like this, she says. 
And I was very happy to receive this uh, reaction. And we also um, uh, uh, train the parents uh, to engage their children in uh, the care of their uh, grandparents. They can do, there are things they can do. They should not fear, but they should not take over responsibility, but they can also help their parents in the caregiving of the uh, person with dementia in the family. I think this is uh, about all that I would like to say. I'm happy to be here to have the, this opportunity. I would like to answer any questions or any comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fusen, for your speech. And you have got already some congratulations in the chat. And also one question, um, if the material about dementia is available, maybe it's useful for other countries if they live families with a Turkish background. Is it yes, on your website, course. for instance? Uh, yeah, I didn't think of that, but uh, I uh, had something about this uh, in connection with ADI and uh, Laura in ADI made some connection with me and some other representatives from other countries who were planning to do something like this. But of course, as uh, you have mentioned, we can uh, load this on our website and other Turkish speaking children in other countries can also benefit from that. Thank you. Good Thank idea. You. Thank you very much also for the Thank last you. quote of the child that we should be lovely to everybody. So Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, yes. yes. Thank you, Fusen. I take over now for our next speaker. That's a pre-recorded uh, talk from Lauren Gilly. She is the head of public affairs of France Alzheimer. And also many times we heard you speaking already, Lorraine, and I'm really looking forward to this speak, uh, speech now. Hello, everyone. I'm Lorraine Gilly, head of public affairs at France Alzheimer and uh, related disease. I am really pleased to participate to this uh, 31st Alzheimer Europe conference and to present today our intergenerational dementia initiatives. What if we talk about Alzheimer's disease, an educational booklet for children. It all starts with the Little Citizens program held by the French Léo Lagrange Federation which has the will to develop uh, tools in order to stimulate an open-minded spirit for children from 7 to 11 years old. Through this uh, program, the team of the Little Citizen Association, Les Petits Citoyens in French, develop educational and fun tools to raise awareness and to enable children to question and wonder about the world surrounding them. It uh, stimulates their curiosity and it uh, encourages them to build their analytical mind and thus to make up their own minds on, the, on specific different subjects. So since 2001, Les Petits Citoyens have developed 33 different booklets to address subjects in the collection, what if we talk about? And it can be subjects such as gender equality or bullying at school, for example. And this is really the will of the Association Les Petits Citoyens, which by arousing questioning, debate, and curiosity through text and illustrations, hopes that this never-ending collection will contribute to the development of uh, an active citizenship from the younger age and will give children a taste for reading and thinking. So, in uh, 2020, France Alzheimer and Les Petits Citoyens finally decided to launch a partnership and to create a specific booklet dedicated to explaining Alzheimer's disease to the youngest. And uh, this uh, booklet will be published for World Alzheimer's Day the, the same year. 
And for Franz Alzheimer, it really appeared as a great challenge in fostering an inclusive society by explaining the disease to the youngest. And we worked really hard with the team of uh, Les Petits Citoyens to find the right words uh, to explain the mechanisms of the disease and its uh, daily consequences. And indeed, designed in a ludic and educational way with simple words, with comic book characters that children can identify with, and with cartoons. This uh, specific booklet helps start the discussion with the children and answer their main questions. So, um, thanks to this uh, booklet, children will understand more about Alzheimer's disease through discussions between uh, the characters you can see now on your screen. Um, let me introduce you to Arthur, Gary, Sarah, and Petite Marianne, and Agathe. Uh, and over the 10 different illustrated stories, they discover uh, that this disease affects memory, but also language and behavior. And this uh, booklet will help um, those characters, but also the children, uh, to know how to behave with a person living with dementia and to understand the importance of the daily presence of those around her. And as you can see here, we wanted to show you the 10 different sequences uh, of the booklet dedicated to Alzheimer's. Uh, it follows the evolution of first an introducing the subject, then explaining the disease and its main consequences, and putting the characters in different situations of the daily life. It really anchors the story in reality to give a perspective and to allow identification. This booklet, edited in more than uh, 50,000 copies, has been distributed since September 2020 in the schools and leisure centers of the network of Les Petits Citoyens. And uh, thanks to the local branches of uh, France Alzheimer and related disease. 25,000 copies have been sent to the local branches of France Alzheimer and uh, 25,000 uh, copies have been distributed in the 380 leisure centers of the Léo Lagrange Federation, where 59,000 children are present every day. The facilitators of the Federation, trained with the tools of uh, Les Petits Citoyens, offer time to work with children around the discovery and the comprehension of Alzheimer's disease. So awareness and the debate workshop are organized every day on various topics um, around the, the, the disease and for children to express themselves, uh, to listen to others, and to give their own uh, opinion on what this disease represents from their point of view. The objective being uh, to fight stigmatization and to help children understand the importance of supporting people living with dementia and their caregivers. And this is truly a, a beautiful edition that we are really proud of and we recently had to take the decisions to print an additional 40,000 copies. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach me at the address below. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, Lorraine, for this, um, for this um, information about your children's booklet. Um, 
There's no chat, uh, no question in the chat yet, but I have a question. Um, you said that you print another 40,000 copies. Um, uh, are you going to, to distribute it in schools again? And is it free of charge for the schools? If they are interesting to get it for some classes, they can order it uh, at your association? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, the schools can order the, the booklets through our network of uh, local branches. We have uh, local branches in every, um, well, uh, administrative regions of France. So uh, we are still uh, uh, broadcasting the booklet and hope it will uh, have uh, more and more success during the, the next months. Thank you. So I, it's very comfortable for the schools <laughs> if they can order it free of charge. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Sabine. I don't understand what's going on with my sound. Okay, I said, maybe we try again. I said it's very comfortable for the schools if they can order it free of charge. Yes, really, it really is. It's a, it's a good way to spread the, the information and to spread the booklet and to make sure that we reach more and more schools and more and more uh, leisure centers every, day, every time. Okay, so I hope that you reach many, many schools and also children's, of course, children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. I take over to the next uh, speaker, the last speaker of the session, last but not least, no, yes. And it's Ilaria Chirico from Italy. She's uh, from the University of Bologna, but living or staying in Padua, as I've learned. So you have a pre-recorded um, speech, I think, um, but you are here for, for questions after the recording. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Ilaria Chirico and I'm a research fellow at the Department of Psychology at the University of Bologna. Uh, today we'll discuss uh, about systematic review conducted with my team on young people's experience of parental dementia. 78% of young people in Europe care for an ill of disabled parents. One third of people living with young or dementia have a child under 18 years. Uh, reasons are several, mainly the increase of childbirth age and of the number of remarried couples. This phenomenon is quite uh, underestimated because caring is often viewed as a natural extension of family relationships and the young people tend not to disclose their situation because of the fear of being taken away um, from their families. Most research on dementia focuses on spouses and adult children experience of this condition. Our aim was to uh, specifically focus and analyze the literature on children, young people with the experience of parental dementia, um, paying particular attention to the psychosocial impact of, this, of their parents' condition, their development. We follow PRISMA guidelines, we search articles until January 2020. Uh, our inclusion criteria were represented by children and young people as a population of interest, children and young people living and or caring for a parent with dementia as a context of interest, children and young people experience parental dementia told by themselves as the outcome of interest. All the studies should have been peer-reviewed. At the beginning, we collect 871 articles, and after all the stages of the um, screening process, we finally include in the review uh, 21 articles. We use the quantitative and the qualitative checklist to um, evaluate the methodologies of the studies, and the key results were analyzed by using inductive thematic analysis. As for results, all the studies were conducted in the Western countries, mainly in the United Kingdom, followed by United States, Norway, Australia, uh, Netherlands, and Sweden. 18 articles use a qualitative approach with a cross-sectional design. One study uses a cross-sectional quantitative approach, and the remaining two studies use a mixed methodology in a cross-sectional design. Um, as for the qualitative studies, uh, they mostly use semi-structured interviews, 
The only observational study used an online survey, while the remaining two studies use a mixed methodology, which consists of both questionnaire and semi-structured interviews. Child sample sites uh, range between three and uh, 24 participants, were well, mostly females. The age range between 14 and 31 years, and they mostly lived in their own house. Parental sample sites vary between 3 and 23 participants, they were mostly males. Uh, the age range between 45 and 66 years, and they mostly lived in their own house. Um, for what concerns the uh, methodological evaluation of these studies, qualitative studies score quite high, and uh, the only weaknesses were concerned with a limited description of the sample, the sampling method, and some misinformation in the data analysis. Uh, conversely, quantitative studies score quite low, and uh, main gaps uh, um, regarding the methodology or the results section. The thematic analysis identified the six overarching themes. Uh, the first um, was about the diagnosis. The diagnosis was very difficult to accept by young people and was preceded by a long period of uncertainty, confusion, stress, and family conflicts. They felt like lost in the chaos. Um, there, was, um, there, there were deep changes in family relationship following the diagnosis. Young people experienced a kind of latent grief since their parent was uh, still physically present but not emotionally available. And uh, they felt stigmatized uh, by society since their suffering was not recognized. Um, they uh, experience a role reversal and uh, at the same time they felt like orphans since they felt in charge to uh, protect the relative parent. Caring tasks uh, were several and uh, it's interesting to notice that they were very similar to those carried out by adult children. Uh, however, these tasks were very difficult to reconcile with their developmental needs. Young people provide both instrumental but also emotional support and to both parents as to keep their family together. Burden was higher when uh, children lived uh, with a single parent with dementia or the families had uh, financial troubles or the healthy parent was uh, um, really emotionally overwhelmed by the situation and not and was not able to manage the um, um, to manage the situation ways children found reasonable. Um, burden was lower uh, when the healthy parent was the primary carer managed well quite well the situation. There was a family collaboration and uh, or the child lived away from home. Um, parental dementia strongly impact on uh, several aspects on uh, young people's lives. They felt like limbo, their lives like put, well, were put like on hold, and um, the, their parents' parental condition um, influenced their plans in relation to, edu to education career, but also mobility and personal lives. Uh, school performance worsened, or even they gave up their study. Uh, they felt stigmatized um, at school, and the educational needs in relation to parental dementia were totally neglected or unrecognized. Um, adapt adaptive strategies were represented by adjusting to their parents' needs. Uh, while attempting to live their lives as normally, maintaining social life and social interest, um, um, openly communicated with their family or someone in a select group of people. Uh, conversely, maladaptive strategies were represented by denial, social and emotional withdrawal, uh, smoking, abuse of alcohol, and self-harm. The last theme uh, concern care support. Uh, most young people tend not to disclose their situation. 
and they felt uh, support inappropriate for their needs since services were like silo bases and totally focused on patients solely. Uh, preferred forms of support were represented by peer support groups with people with similar experience um, or with or support provided by professionals who knew their situation, knew their families. Um, since they um, had good uh, digital skills, also the technology could uh, represent uh, a mean of support like forums or group blogs. Um, to conclude, um, these results um, were published this year, and uh, we want to raise awareness about the peculiar and of invisible experience of young people with apparent with dementia. We want to inform more research, practice, program development, and the policy makers in the area of dementia care. Uh, for sure, we need more research, more uh, well done research but also we need to think about the importance to implement preventing action to avoid the negative consequences of caring at young age which in turn will save society um, the cost of increased health care we cannot uh, um, think to work with this population without uh, adopting a will family approach and uh, this approach uh, um, should take into account all family members um, and should be flexible and proactive, focus on specific needs, specific times. Uh, at school or university, a clear framework of support should be embedded into the policy. Chance for students to reveal their situation are necessary, along with trainings for, for teachers to recognize and supporting their needs. All these initiatives should be based on children, young people, and their family involvement in decision making as to develop tailored intervention suite to the particular needs of this population. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ilaria, for this talk. I think your results show how uh, important all these practical projects are that we heard before from, because some results are really sad, I think, so that children are not uh, hurt in a proper way, or what do you think? Yeah, uh, most of research is on um, spouses and uh, adult children experience, but we don't have so many data about the young children and young people experience of parental dementia. Um, and also we need um, to develop intervention aimed to um, more focused on this particular condition because we know that um, a parent with dementia can, can, can be uh, still uh, physically present but not uh, emotionally available. And uh, this is something that uh, can affect negatively uh, the stigma and the chance for society to recognize this problem. So this is very um, underestimate phenomenon which needs more research from a quantitative point of view because as we saw we don't have so many quantitative data uh, and also on the basis of them we should develop the intervention specifically focused on this condition and on this particular relationship which is among a child and a parent and is different like among a child and a grandparent or grandmother yes thank you very much and thank you once again, all of you. I think we had a very interesting session with five different presenters and a bit scientific, um, but also some practical projects from five countries. And I think uh, we all know that it's very important to also address this group of children and young people because they are affected by their grandparents, but sometimes also because of their parents, if you think about some more rare forms of dementia like frontotemporal dementia. We have much younger uh, family members who are affected also with parents. And so it's very important to, to go on with the work in all countries. And 
I, um, I take home or sp especially one quote from, I think it was Fania from your project, from one child who said, if um, you get dementia, if you start again believing on Santa Claus, I think that fits very good in this um, period of the year. And I thank you very much and wish you much success and um, with your projects and um, enjoy the Alzheimer Europe conference. Thank you very much also to our attendees.